our session is likely to be intense because we will be dealing with the core of philosophy and also faith in Christ. May God grant us grace. The style may be slightly different, but please bear with me because I'm assuming that I've got an audience um, and this audience is ready to know the mind of God and also engage with realities of life. So it will be intertwined with scripture, science, the core of philosophy and all that, trusting that in the midst of all this, we will be better equipped as evangelists, as the gentleman who led the opening prayer said, and we will be better presented. We will, be, we will better present the word of God out there. And things will become clearer so that we know that besides what is written in the Bible, like our dear pastor said, the things around us, nature speaks about God in volumes. Aspects of what we will be dealing with tonight can be found <laughs> in a book. And I'll tell you something surprising. Sorry, bear with me. We'll get to the core of it. Pastor Charles um, <laughs> wrote the forward to the book he's talking about. The one you already have is Where is God in All of This? And the one he's talking about, by God's grace, is already available on okay. Amazon. We've got a Kindle version and a hard copy already available. You can even Google on Amazon, Faith or Science, where are we getting it from? Then you can add my name, Kobe Kodia, to it. So we have copies already available. I'm glad that everyone in Archway is going to have it for free. Thank you, Pastor Chess. Right, on our topic today and possibly next week, um, Faith or Science, where are we getting it wrong? Like Pastor explained, is it Faith and Science? Or should it be faith or science? That clearly explains the topic. Are we marrying faith and science or we are divorcing faith and science? When do we bring the two together? And if we are to do that, how do we do it? Is one competing against the other? For instance, if I'm prayed in church and I receive my healing, does that mean that the doctor's prediction of my health condition was wrong? You see that we're dealing with a very important thing. And if I meet someone who is also describing nature scientifically, explaining, for example, the origin or possibly the subsequent development of COVID-19, coronavirus and other types of viruses and bacteria infections and all that. Should I just overlook these explanations and say, God would take care of me. He has done it in the past. I remember when I was poorly and I cried to him and he healed me. How should we balance these things? Because for us Pentecostals, friends, we have seen the spectacular move, this, I beg your pardon, the spectacular move of the Holy Spirit in our midst. We have seen divine healing. We have seen miracles. We have seen the hand of God at work. Should we just dwell within that periscope? Or we should be maybe humble enough to also allow room for other interventions? We also have other people who, on the basis of advanced scientific knowledge, are denying the existence of miracles. I was speaking to a friend. Friends, just bear with me because the, the, the style is, is as we are going. And along the line, we'll be chipping in some of these practical expositions. I was telling a friend that there's a gentleman in the history uh, 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 of, uh, let's say, the West, right from the days of the Enlightenment, David Hume's a Scottish philosopher. And the damage he has done to society, oh, man. After the writings of David Hymns, I know many other people, uh, Christopher, <laughs> Christopher Hitchens and, and co, Peter Atkins and, and those other guys have taken the root of David Hymns, especially when he messed up with the concept of miracles. Miracles. And this is where as believers, I'm excited about tonight's topic because we will have opportunity to engage with the core of these mess-ups and see how best we can dribble around. For example, David Hymns would tell you that miracles are the breaking uh, of a natural law. And if you are not careful to consider this definition well, you will be tempted to say, oh yeah, when there is a miracle, there's a natural law which has been broken. But you see, what David Hymns is trying to say is that natural laws cannot be broken. So immediately you accept a miracle as the breaking of a natural law, which is what our philosophy books define, our historic books define, our scientific books define. Immediately you accept that definition. You are just drawing, drawing yourself into the atheistic world to believe that natural laws cannot be broken. Therefore, there are no miracles. This is exactly what David Hymns is saying, but he has put it in a different way. That miracles are the breaking of a natural law. But they are not. 
Miracles don't break natural law because when Jesus, when we believers believe that Jesus, when we Christians, I beg your pardon, when we Christians believe that Jesus ascended on, on high, he, he has not broken the law of gravity, but rather he has interposed, inter <laughs> he has um, transposed or interposed, or he has actually brought in a new law. He has introduced, that's what the word I'm struggling for, he has introduced a new law on top of the additional law, on top of the laws he already has. On top of the laws we already have. I beg your pardon. Let me organize myself. So when a miracle happens, what actually has happened is the transposition of a new law onto the existing laws. Let me clarify that before we get into this. So for example, Jesus ascends on high. I'm trying to explain that he has not broken the law of gravity. And therefore, I hear many people, oh, yeah, therefore, the law of gravity bars. When Jesus walks on water, he has not broken the law of flotation. No, he hasn't at all. Because immediately you say there's a breaking of a law, then it means that the next person, somebody should also jump. That law exists. And therefore, if you jump, you will come down. But what he has done is rather, he has introduced a new law that with me, Although the equation exists, there is an additional law that we are yet to find. And this is the law. That is why when he ascends on high, then he's also talking about another day when Paul explains that we shall be raptured. So there will be an additional law for people of the kind of Christ that the world has not yet seen. And that is what is called a miracle. When he converts water to wine, he has not broken the law of fermentation. What he has done is that he has introduced an additional law, which means that the, the, the reaction can be facilitated and made instant. So miracles are the introduction of new laws, new laws of nature. And therefore, all scientists must be humble enough to explore these additional things. These additional things. Why I'm bringing these things is as, as, for us Christians, we usually fall into this pit and we don't know the atheistic intent behind the definitions provided in our dictionaries, in our science books, in our history books, in our philosophies, philosophy books, and all that, because it is always to push away God. Right? Let's come home. Faith or science? Where are we getting it wrong? Where are we getting it wrong? Right. In my own way, I've heard statements like, ignore the doctors, ignore the lawyers. They are not God. What God says is final. And I hear words like, who, 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 who shall we believe? Who shall believe the report of the Lord? This is the report of the Lord. So all the time is a siege. There's a certain group of people. And now there's also the word of God. And that word of God must act against that group of people. I'm sure by the end of this presentation, either tonight or next week, we, we will see how to marry the, the, the two. Because personally, I feel very bad when I hear or I get an impression from the church. And when I say the church, I don't mean the church of Penn because I'm talking about the church universal. So maybe let me change it. When I get this impression from believers that uh, there's a group of people called scientists and they are anti-God. They are doing things against God. So, for example, when these issues about the 5G, the coronavirus came, it's like there's a certain group of people called the scientists and they are developing a certain technology and that technology is going to fight against Christianity. That technology is going to give successes. That it's like a certain group of people. I say, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Don't let us repeat the mistakes of the days of Galileo when he invented the telescope. The very people who fought against it were the clergy, were the people of faith, because they thought that looking through the telescope was revealing the galaxies, which were contradictory to the biblical description. But they lack understanding in what the Bible was saying about the creation of the earth. So let's be careful, because there are scientists in our midst, because there are people who are advanced thinkers in our midst as Christians. And all key developers of new knowledge have also been Christians or at worst Jews. So we should be careful that we do not pitch our faith against knowledge. We should be careful that we do not pitch our faith against science. So how best do we balance this? How best do we balance this? <laughs> okay, right. To address it, there are four ways I'm going to look at it, but possibly tonight we'll just look at the first, the first two. The first one, I believe, to help us understand this question of do we deploy science or faith 
is to understand what faith is and faith is not. What is faith and what is not faith? So that's going to be our first objective. And I pray that the Holy Spirit will illuminate our understanding on this. What is faith and what is not faith? Because this is the core of everything. What is faith and what is not faith? Then we will extend to the second objective to understand what is science and what are the limitations of science and reasoning. Just allow me to expand it beyond science and say reasoning. So what are the boundaries of science and reasoning? What is the limits of science? What is science? When we talk about science, when we talk about reasoning, what are these things? Then a third one, basically, I think that's referring to chapter three or chapter four of the book. I observed that some ghosts have been killed by science. So we will walk through the different kinds of gods I've seen <laughs> and how science have killed these gods. Then you soon realize that the God that we are talking about, the triune God, the God, the Father, the God, the Son, God, God, God the Holy Spirit, so God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This God has not been killed by science, but rather he has been revealed by science, contrary to what many think. So we will look at various goals, just to give you an appetite for, for that chapter or that session. You see, I, I have seen the God of rain being killed, especially when I understood atmospheric physics and knew how rain <laughs> was formed and all that. The so-called God of rain, the God that gives rain, was killed. Again, when you understand f f fertility and all that, you, you see that, that that god of fertility also has been killed. Not only that, the god of thunder, lightning, they have all been killed. They were these ancient gods. But when we're talking about our kind of god, he is the creator. Therefore, every exploration of whether rain, whether fertility, whatever form of scientific investigation you conduct, you conduct revealed in it. Our God is not killed by science, but he is revealed by science. And the last point would be to strike the balance. To strike the balance. How do we balance? When do we deploy faith? When do we deploy science? How do we merge the two? Yeah, so let me just go over the four objectives. We will just highlight on the two today, tonight, sorry. First, to properly understand what faith is and faith is not. Then we also look at the boundaries of science and reasoning. Then God willing, next week, we will look at the ghosts who have been killed by science. And now we strike the balance between faith and science. I pray that the Holy Spirit will help us in Jesus' mighty name and grant us deeper insight into his truth. May Jesus himself stir up grace within us tonight as we explore these concepts in the name of Jesus. Okay. So now, what is faith? And what is not faith? My dear brothers and sisters, Arthur, if you pick any book on philosophy, and it's one of the books I, I, I read a lot, <laughs> philosophy. <laughs> uh, if you pick any book on philosophy or modern English text or even a basic dictionary and you look for the definition of faith, faith is defined as belief without evidence. Ooh. And this is where we have to be careful. This is the classic definition of faith. To believe in something without evidence. Do you, know, do, you, do, you, do you know what that means? It means that faith is for fools. Literally, this is what that definition means. Faith is for fools. And you begin to understand why I'm a bit concerned and passionate about what is written in our books because it's a gentle but a serious strategic attempt to win a whole generation into the world without God. So he says, if you believe in anything without evidence, it's called faith. So when somebody calls you, oh, he's a person of faith, or what is your faith? What faith do you belong? It means that you are a person that believes in certain things. Meanwhile, there is no evidence. But you see, sadly, I see Christians jumping for this because they think our kind of faith is without evidence. And it is based on some random experiences within the supernatural. And sometimes it is based on their lack of understanding about certain phenomena. Oh, yes, pastor, you know, I was going through this and all of a sudden something happened. Our God is good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Take it easy. Take it easy. Take it easy. I believe in all these supernatural encounters. I've had one myself. I've seen it all my life. I believe in that. But let's be careful that it does not become the root of our faith alone, if that alone becomes the root of our faith, my fear 
And for the purpose of my submission tonight is that the day you understand that phenomena scientifically, you will start doubting the God behind the phenomena. Ooh, maybe I should calm down on this, but you see that my passion is rising because I feel that it's a dangerous position because as we leave, my dear brothers and sisters, one day we will all, or most of us will understand some of the phenomena that we call super, in quotes. We will come to understand. Should I take you just a bit backwards on this? There are many things in our lives we didn't understand some years past, but now we understand. And if I bet to say, this is the cancer that rooted itself in the cell of the West and caused many people to deny the existence of God because there are many things that were attributed to supernatural occurrences and the existence of God were soon understood when science and knowledge advanced. When they advanced. So how do we justify the existence of our God? If a person's understanding of God is based on the inexplicable, they stand the chance of losing their faith when explanations of such strange things arrive, when Im immediately things we did not understand and attributed to spirits, immediately we begin to understand. <laughs> then the question is this. I have a very good brother in my district and the so daughter was poorly. And um, we prayed. In fact, she, she, she had been told that she would not walk. She would not walk. And I remember one of our Holy Ghost conventions, we were moved by the Spirit to invite the child forward and the whole congregation stretched forth our hands towards the child and prayed for supernatural things to happen. In fact, I believed at that time that by the end of the prayer, oh, the girl was going to rise out of the wheelchair and walk. You can imagine the fate of your pastor. Kaba, so Kaba, we pray them, pray them, pray them, pray. Please just listen carefully because sometimes it can be misunderstood if you don't listen to the end. I'm making a very important point. We prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. The girl didn't get up to walk. Okay. To fast track the story, they went home. In fact, that night, I couldn't sleep. I said, Jesus Christ. I acted on faith. Why didn't it work? Oh, Lord. But for some reason, in my heart, I knew God was going to do something. By the grace of God, a week on, our, our, our brother and the wife called, and they were shouting, praising God, saying, Lord Jesus, we thank you, Pastor. God bless you. You see, when we got home, a week after, we saw our child one time making an attempt to get up, and she got up pushed the wheelchair aside. We helped her uh, walk around. She held onto the wall after some time here and there. And now our child is walking and shouted, Jesus, we bless you. We thank God. And friends, there was a service. <laughs> we had district joint not long after because we had to clear the air. You see, the first time we prayed and then the child didn't walk. Now that the child is walking, we were praying and it's a testimony time, testimony time. Shall we invite and so, so and so and the wife with their child? Then the child started walking from the back. All of us burst out, worshiping God, blessing God here and there. Okay, I'm making a point. Don't lose, don't lose out in the point. We had faith. We prayed. We believed in God. It didn't happen instantly, but they went home. It happened. Then one day, I traveled with this family to a place for checkup and all that. Then the doctor started explaining the transition, the stage, and where it was possible for the child to get up and walk. So now the gentleman just looked at my face and it was like, oh yeah, so it means the time was up. That's why um, my child walked. So the very thing that we were attributing to God, there seemed to be a kind of scientific explanation to it. Then I said, hold on, hold on, hold on. We must come to the point where we understand that the scientific explanation is also a revelation of what God is doing in our lives 
so that whether there is science or no science, whether science explains it or not, it is only describing what God has done in human form. And I said, oh, cool. This is a better way of viewing what God does so that one does not become the opponent of the other. Let's carry on. So you see what was done in church has also been explained scientifically. And I give praise to God because God gives room to this uh, phenomenon. This way of understanding God as in he has done something supernaturally great, therefore he exists, is dangerous. Because like I'm saying, over time, we may have or understand some of the things we consider supernatural. But then, how do we place God in that context? Let's therefore be careful to engage with the proper definition of faith. So let, let, let's try to understand faith, what actually faith is. In fact, the author of Hebrews uh, gives a very, I think it's the most popular chapter on faith, Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. I will just pick verses 1 and 2 from the New King James Version, my dear ones. I'm sure you're following uh, up to this point. Hebrews 11. Let's just pick verses 1 and 2. The author says, now faith is... Uh, please, I'm reading from the New King James Version for, for a reason. Now, faith is the substance <laughs> of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders of old obtained a good testimony. The elders obtained a good testimony. Hebrews 11, 1 2. Let's decode the content very well. He says, now faith is the substance. Please, if you miss anything tonight, just remember the word substance. I'm sure we don't need a dictionary to understand substance. Substance means something tangible, something you can hold to some extent, an object, something may be visible. So he says, faith is that thing. I don't know how we jump over that explanation and want to make faith imaginary. But he, he says that faith is that thing, that thing, that substance. Then he clarifies. You see how it's written with a comma. So the next part of the sentence is explaining the previous side. So he says that the evidence of things not seen. So you see, faith actually is an evidence. It's not a thing not seen but rather the evidence of the thing not seen, the substance, the tangibility, the reality, that visibility, that object, that thing that can be held onto of the thing that is not seen. That is what is faith. It's not the thing that is not seen. <laughs> so he says, for by it, you know what he's trying to say? For by this substance and by this evidence, the elders obtained a good testimony. A good yeah. testimony. This is faith, substance, evidence. It means that faith must be tangible. It means that faith must be evidence-based. Let's crack on a bit. As shown, faith is a substance, like I just said. The material components, that tangible entity of things hoped for, the evidence, in fact, assurance of things unseen, Hence, faith is the evidence of things unseen. This is all I'm trying to say. It is the evidence of what has happened before. Please, two words are very important in our conversation tonight. Substance and evidence. You see, and it, it is what must cause us to believe. <laughs> faith is the component of understanding that remains in us as a result of the evidence provided. In other words, when we're talking about faith, we must show, we must show something. We must denote something. We must, so don't let us, you see the earlier point I was trying to, don't let us base our faith just on the imaginary. I use the word just because sometimes we have no choice than to do that. But our faith should not just be based on the imaginary, but our faith must be based on the evidence provided. Any type of faith which is not based on evidence must be classified as blind faith. John Lennon, in one of his books, has done a great justice, great work on that blind faith. Any faith which is not based on evidence must be classified as blind. As, as blind. And I don't think we should take blind faith seriously. And this is why I'm a bit careful about the definition provided in our philosophy books and our science books and, and, and also in, in dictionaries. 
Because when we say that it is believed without evidence, actually we are only defining blind faith. It's not our kind of faith at all. And that's why we should not jubilate in that. In real life, we don't even deploy blind faith. Let me just cite some examples. I, I used to be using a Ford, a Ford car. When the car is broken down, I'll be looking for a Ford garage or at where's a, a garage nearby. Why would I take my car to a garage? Because I've got the faith that the garage has the capability to repair it. Why wouldn't I take it to Sainsbury's and pack it there? Because I know Sainsbury does not deal with car repairs. Of course, I'm talking about Sainsbury's, uh, the, the retail shop. For groceries and all that. So, if our actions are based on what we know of a thing, then it is the same way. You see, my faith in the Ford garage is based on my understanding of the capability of that garage. It is my faith in Ford and its garage which compels me to send my car there. This is what faith, my dear brothers and sisters, is about. It is built on evidence. I must know that the garage is able to repair cars before I send it there. So our belief in God, our faith in God, must be based on the fact that there is evidence that he is able to do the things I have come to him for. He is able to take care. He is able to keep to his promises. And this is why I have faith in him. So that when it is delayed, his CV, oh man, look at how the Bible says, the thief came to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus presents his manifesto and clearly he stated that, but I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. I have come. So he says that, look, compare the two of us. These are our manifestos. One came to steal, to kill and to destroy, but I have come. Then now he proves it and there's a biblical record of him proving that he has come to give life and give it more abundantly. My faith is based on that evidence on that evidence, not on the things that are ha just happening. i careful always to use the word just, <laughs> just happening. <laughs> There's no real trust is developed outside evidence. <laughs> in the scenario I cited, my faith in the garage may be based on the track record of the garage. So there's a track record or online customer reviews, direct recommendation from a friend or based on false own recommendation. Either way, there's a reason for me to choose that garage. I may ignore the reasons available and still decide blindly, but it does not mean that there is no available factors to be considered. So the world can ignore <laughs> what Romans was describing in your last teachings. The world can ignore these visible or tangible evidence for the existence of God, but it does not mean that the evidence is not available. So people can deploy blind faith, and I do not dispute that, but the main point is that at every decision-making point, there will be enough evidence to some extent, for the decision to be based on. Let's look for that. Let me give you another example. I, I think John Lennon cited it, and I, and I just love the illustration he gave about uh, the, the, the fact that, my, for example, the lo I love my wife, and she has faith in my love for her. Let, let me put it that way, because some ladies prefer to hear that that you, you love them instead of them love you. Uh, they, 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 they hide within the Ephesians scripture <laughs> on, on that. So she has faith in my love for her. Some ladies prefer to hear that, like I said. <laughs> this faith is not random. I have proved it over time. And I'm sure she has also proved it over time. And this is why we maintain the opinion that we love each other. If you have not proved it, I don't think you can rest your love on that. It is not blind faith. True faith is based on evidence, my dear brothers and sisters. This is the core of what we're trying to share. And I think that this is where we must be careful in our understanding of faith. Random, unverified instances of occurrences which generate faith are good, but there is enough evidence in daily life to justify the existence of God and hence our faith in him. And this has to be emphasized. My dear ones, all I'm trying to say is that in addition to the supernatural, we have seen God in many things we understand scientifically. So explanations should not become a threat to our faith. For the true God is not threatened by science. 
he is rather revealed by science. <laughs> I hope you will have time to go through through this. Let, let me just let me just give this practical engineering analogy. Maybe it will help. You see, I was talking about taking my car to the garage. My understanding of what the mechanic does to repair my car to cause me to appreciate the enormous design, the enormous mechanical engineering, the enormous thermodynamics, the enormous rotary dynamics and all that, the enormous science manufacturing principles that have been embedded in the car. In appreciating the principles, I would in no way be displacing Ford the manufacturer, but rather admiring the manufacturer of his ingenuity. Now, you see, sadly enough, in our world today, we appreciate the mechanic who is repairing. We appreciate the mechanic who is providing explanations to why the car has broken down and forget that the car in the first place was manufactured. And this is why I was compelled to write a personal message to our prime minister when by God's grace he left the hospital having severely suffered from coronavirus and was on and on with the NHS, our doctors, our days. I salute all our doctors and nurses, our fantastic NHS system. My friends, let's be careful here. Sometimes some statements have got atheistic worldviews in them and we should be careful. Ventilators do not give life, my dear ones. What gives life is the breath of God. Ventilators provide oxygen, and oxygen does not give life. You must have life before oxygen is important. Otherwise, there is abundant oxygen. There is enough oxygen in our mortuaries, and therefore dead bodies should be alive. Ooh, I'm seeing something. Possibly I'm opening some kind of worms. But the truth of the matter is oxygen does not give life. You must have life for oxygen to be relevant. What gives life is the breath of God. What science does is just to provide and expand and explain the existence of life, but it does not give life. The breath of God gives life. So when God molded man, he breathed into him and man became a living, oh my God. So the starting point of life is in breath. So if you ever go to the hospital, and your life is preserved is because the giver of breath did not take it away. The breath must exist before medical intervention becomes useful. So in as much as we appreciate our wonderful healthcare system, our wonderful professionals, maybe we can extend our appreciation to the origin of life. So let's start from there. I bless God for giving me this life. I bless God for preserving my breath. And I thank the medical professionals for keeping my breath in, for, sorry, for keeping my life. Whilst I have the breath, these two bits must always be played with, must always be played together. Sorry, must always be played together. Otherwise, we will soon push away the originator of life. Friends, I therefore humbly submit for our consideration that faith is a reasoned position to believe in something based on the evidence provided. Can I just repeat that for the sake of emphasis, those of you who may want to listen or write or uh, are carefully taking us. Faith is a reasoned position. It's a reason. I'm using the word reason because remember, the earlier definition made it look like people of faith are without thinking capabilities and it's for fools. Fools. But rather, I believe that it's a reasoned position to believe in something based on the evidence provided. Before becoming a committed Christian, I'll tell you a bit about my background. My dad, for some reason, well, he was just searching for truth in court and not coming from a very rich family. So we didn't have enough rooms and having grown as the only boy in the family, he, he decided to, to give me a place to sleep and guess where my room was? It was his living room and that's where he kept all his books. So my, the living room was literally his library. So I had the opportunity anytime I'm going to bed, I'm surrounded just by books, just by books. So I will be reading and I read and read and read. I think in as much as you would think that that was great, but it nearly affected me because I read books beyond my age. And I started getting into all sorts of things here and there, just trying to experiment, to explore here and there. So I took time 
to study all the Eastern religions. And I took time to study Christianity. I took time to study all the traditional religions. I took time to investigate all these people, all great philosophers and all that. Then I set a criteria for myself that I'm going to choose which one I think logically is right. Please follow me for a moment. Then I compared one with the other. Okay, moral teaching. Oh yeah, each of them is talking about something good here and there. But when I extended my research and exploration, I came to the point that I wanted to check who among them is providing a solution to the problems of mankind. I have taken time to provide a route to the problems of mankind, and I found a route to the problem because one of the books was telling me that in the beginning it was not so. So I found out what actually uh, interfered with the original pattern of things, and I found that sin, sin, sin interfered. So I was looking for who among all these great philosophers would provide a solution to sin. But I found out that in all the teachings and the books I read, each of these guys was talking about how to live with it, how to be nice, how to be this, how to be that. But I came to the book of Matthew, my dear brothers and sisters, and it blew my mind. I think it's Matthew 1, 21, also 22, 23, or something like that. And I hear an angel announcing the entry of somebody, and he says that he shall be called Jesus because he will save his people from the sins, from their sins. I said, oh, cool. So somebody actually is dealing with the root cause of the problem. Then I carried on with it and realized that in dealing with it, he submitted himself to be killed, to be made the penalty to that sin. And that was not the end. I found out that only one of them claimed to have resurrected. And only one of them claims to be alive forever. And only one of them, when you believe, is able to transform you. So his testimony goes beyond a set of rules and regulations. But his testimony talks about him coming to live in us, to make us the people that God has made us to be. And I could trust that testimony. That's the evidence. Because he has proved it. He has proved it. When he talks about nature, he walks on water. When he talks about nature, he ascends. So when he says that he's the creator, I can believe him. I can believe him. Our faith must be a reason, position. First, as I speak this way, I want you to check yourself and start asking, why do I believe in God? Because until you have a solid ground to, you have solid ground, sorry, to believe in the existence of God, you will start messing up one day when you begin to understand why things happen. So tell me, explain how the earth was formed. Tell me the Big Bang theory in science. In fact, explain Darwinian theory to me and talk about how human beings evolved from apes here and there. Tell me about the molecules of life, friends. Can I announce to you my joy? You are only explaining to me what my God has done. What my God has put in place is nothing new to me. It's not competing with my God. Because when you talk about the Big Bang Theory, you are talking about a certain collision that happened. But I also understand that one day my God said, let there be light. The Bible has not explained the mechanism or the process for the making of the light. But there was a word that said, let there be light. And science comes to me saying that there was a Big Bang. You are only describing what the Bible has said. We're only describing what the Bible has said. Tell me that we evolved. Yes, of course we evolved. But the Bible has told me about the origin of mankind. Adam and Eve were formed. And out of Adam, all men came. All of us came. All humankind came. What is Darwin saying? He's only talking about the evolution of Adam and Eve. As turning to whatever you are describing as evolution, I care less about it because you are only exposing the magnificent hand of my God, of my God. He does not compete with science. Science rather reveal him. <laughs> oh, I can go on and on and on with this. Because faith must be a reason position. Can, can, can I just share this with you? One day, young Van David was found before a certain man called Goliath. And he, he had to fight him. But you see, this is where we have to be careful on this faith thing. In 1 Samuel 17, 34 to 37, David does something. He reflected. And you see, let, let, let's just go through the wording of it in 1 Kings. 1 Kings. 1 Kings. Sorry, 1 Samuel, I beg your pardon. 1 Samuel 17, 34 to 37. He says that your servant has been keeping his father's sheep. 
So you see how he's recollecting, how he's going back. When a lion or a bear came and carried off a sheep from the flock and went after it, struck it and rescued the sheep from its mouth, when it turned on me, I seized it by its hair, struck it and killed it. Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear. Listen, listen to this. This uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he has defied the armies of the living God. Now, I like this latter part. The Lord who rescued me. You see his evidence. You see his starting point. The Lord who rescued me. The Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear who rescued me from the hand of this Philistine. Oh man, what is the lesson here? He didn't just jump around going, hey, I'm going to kill Goliath. Goliath, you cannot insult uh, God and all that. But he's got a reference point. He says that I've got a foundation. I've got a basis. Look, I have encountered this God. He delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear. If this God in his CV is able to deliver me from the paw of the lion, lion and the bear then you are less than the lion you are less than the bear friends our faith must be evidence-based as i speak this way i know that god has done certain things in your life and as you reflect in it that should spell up a new energy that should spell a new strength in you and compel you to trust him that if he did it in the past he would do it again he would do it again he would do it again my time is up i think so maybe i can go to the second part which was going to look at the boundaries of science and reasoning. So maybe we have dwelt just on faith. I hope it has not been boring and you have gotten. I believe people of faith have grounds to believe in what they believe and are not blind, ignorant folks who have no sense or reasoning power. Reasoning power. We should now stretch ourselves to understand that our faith is evidence based. Any faith not based on evidence must be considered blind faith. Can I just conclude on that part? I don't think I can move on to the science and its limitation, but thankfully, Pastor has given me the opportunity to continue next week so we can continue. But you see, when Peter was admonishing his hearers to say that be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, it means that you must have a reason for the hope that you have. The Bible is the primary evidence, and our own life is the secondary evidence for those of you in research. But we must have every reason for the hope that we have. And this is what we have to share with people. When we explain it this way to people, the Lord himself will pick these words. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word to touch the heart of people so that they will be deeply rooted in him, Christ Jesus. We must therefore be encouraged to understand the basis of our faith in an evidence-oriented manner. Next time, I'll continue with the nature of evidence. What do we call evidence? Thank you very much. And I'll pause over here. My apologies if I've gone over the time. I get excited by these topics. So let me pause. And um, would there be questions? I think there will be questions. Maybe that will lead. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Prof, God bless you so much for for all that you've said today. So, because our time is far gone, we're going to allow maximum of 10 minutes. So, even if one question and eight answer takes 10 minutes, that will be eight. So, if anyone has a question, if you have any question across, uh, please, you are free. But a couple of things that we've learned today. Yes, faith is reason, position to believe in something based on the evidence provided. So, definitely, definitely, uh we are, we are we are not fools in our in our faith in our believing because it's based on something evidential something substantive anyone have any question please fire on anyone unmute yourself and ask any question that you have But uh, the, the way it's gone quiet, it reminds me of what one of my mentors said, that if you, if you teach and <laughs> no one asks a question, it's two, it's two things. <laughs> so please actually help me. Either you <laughs> said useless stuff <laughs> and no one understood you. It's completely not necessary. <laughs> no one is interested. Okay, Eric. Uh, oh, the yeah. second one. 
Maybe the Wait, second one is it means you've done very well and everyone has understood everything all their questions. Yeah, we will, like, we will go with the around. second one. We will go with yeah. the second one. We've really done well. And uh, I think this evening we are so much blessed by your teachings and we commend you for that. That's the main reason why I believe some of us are cool because uh, it has gotten into our bones and uh, in fact, indeed, we are being blessed with this message. We pray that the good Lord will continue to bless you and review much more to you so that when we meet again, we'll be able to upload us with this very important information. God bless you, Reverend. God and bless we, you too, my dear brother. God bless and you. I, um, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Um, God bless you so much, um, um, Pastor. That, is, that was just very, very insightful. And we're... I don't know about anybody else, but I'm very excited about next week. And I think, yeah, the latter is, is probably the reason why you're not getting questions and the fact that we've got next week. So I've got a few questions, but I'm holding on to next week because you might touch on it. But um, to our Pastor Charles, um, for next week, given what um, Pastor has already shared and maybe the questions are, maybe one hour is probably not enough. Can we, can we look at maybe giving an hour and a half or something else to um for for next week so that we don't have to rush off. I wouldn't mind giving him another day like we did with eschatology. We started two weeks and we found out that we needed to go on. Maybe possibly okay. we can allow an hour and a half because he's more time pressed because he's also on the move. So uh, it's a crucial time getting him. So I'll have a chat with him. If he could do three weeks, that's fine. Otherwise then you take uh we start apologizing ahead that or inform you put it on the platform ahead that it will be an hour and a half next week or to go to the third week so we'll update you on that uh having said pastor, that um, pastor sorry um, pastor, you, man, i have just one one question as well i have a, um, yeah, go I have a question to you uh, okay <laughs> the only clause is that prof if the question relates to something you are going to say next week then you pack the question. That is normally what you do. So okay. give it a question you think is something you are going to address next week, then just uh, make that, do it next week. Yeah. Okay, Dave, okay. go ahead. Thank okay, you. Um, um, thank you, Pastor. I'll just read quickly. So from Hebrews 11 and verse 6, so it says, And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever will draw near to God must believe that he exists and he's, and he's a reward of those who seek him. Um, using this verse and in relation to what you said, that faith has to be evident things. But here, in a way, it's saying that when you go near to God, you must first believe that he exists. So in a way, it's, it's trying to, I mean, from what I understand it, I think it's, it's trying to say in a way that you must, you must place some sort of, of faith without evidence. You must believe that he exists and he's a rewarder. Because I will say, in, in, like, in a different way, if you already have the evidence that he exists, then it's not exactly in a way believing in him because you know that he does exist. So how would you relate this verse to your statement that faith has to be evident based. If, if Thank like, you very much. Really, really interesting. You read the scripture carefully. Just, just read it slowly to us. Let's pick it. Let's unpack it. Okay, I'll just read it. Hebrews 11, 6. Yes, yeah, so it says, um, and without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever will draw near to God must believe that he exists and he rewards those who seek him. So whoever believes in God, whoever comes to God must believe that he exists. You know why he's saying that there is abundant evidence around for you to believe that he exists. He's not disputing the evidence at all over there. So what he's trying to say is, if we are not careful, for example, we can believe in all sorts of things. So some believe in non-existent goals. And if we take the definition, the definition as you must believe before the evidence comes, then we can believe in all sorts of things. But in fact, what he's trying to say is that there is abundant evidence. In fact, if you look around, us, there is abundant evidence in nature. Let me just pick a typical example over this period of time and why I, I subscribe to this definition. You know the coronavirus, okay? Uh, if you are to talk about COVID-19, if you are to talk about COVID-19 at this particular time, my dear ones, the question is what caused the disease. Okay, let's just be a bit scientific here. The starting point is, oh yeah, it's a type of virus. Okay, let's move on. Let's downgrade it. Let's come down. What caused 
the, 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 the virus. Oh yeah, he's found in a bat. Cool, cool. Go further. But I will end with a question. Does bats produce viruses? <laughs> I need a virologist to explain that to me. That bat, bat produce. Oh yeah, possibly that there was something mating with a snake and all that. Do snakes produce viruses? Okay. Whoever comes to God must believe that he has it. He has provided evidence, even in the sciences, that we don't know the origin. Science never explains the origin. Science never explains how viruses are formed, but my Bible explains that to me. I mean, if you turn to the book of Genesis, you clearly see that when man sinned, God came to execute judgment. We're going on somewhere. God came to execute judgment. Now, punishment is pronounced on the man. Punishment is pronounced on the woman. But let's look at the punishment on the serpent. Just allow me to take a literal tra in tra translation here. He says that unto you, you are cursed above all livestock. Pick the word above. Pick the word above. You are cursed above all livestock. So you know what that means? It means that if we take it literally, we're not talking about a curse, of course, it represents uh, Satan and all that. But if we take the literal sense, the animal, the serpent is cursed all right, but then he's cursed above all livestock. You know what that means? It means that the animal kingdom also has got the ability to suffer just as all men were punished through Adam and the fall of Adam affected us. All animals also had their portion of it. Therefore, if you see the lion consuming, if you see the swallowing of human beings by animals, if you see the otherwise viruses and bacteria which were supposed to be good because God said that and all these uh, were good when he created them. Now you see another chaotic system being created because the animal kingdom has also been affected. I fully understand why the otherwise good virus and bacteria one day will start knocking and now start working beyond its boundaries. Okay, so the point I'm trying to make is if you take time to study life, if you take time to hear the word of God, if you take time to get it, there is enough evidence for us to believe in the existence of God. Therefore, when you come to God, this is where our gospel must also be pro our gospel must also be provided in such a way that people will not relate to it realistically. Otherwise, we build a generation of people who have got some super understanding of the existence of God. And my worry is the day they understand what they are going through scientifically, they will start denying the existence of God. This is all my burden. Because in as much as it is spiritual, I don't dispute that. Of course, this is my position. Very, very sp spiritual on that. But in addition to that, my dear brother, my whole point is that there is enough evidence around. There is enough evidence in our day-to-day -day life to prove the existence of God. For example, you've gone to a crusade. Sorry, I like giving this a lot. You've gone to a crusade. Someone came in poorly. We pray like the illustration I gave you. In the name of Jesus, arise and walk. God has just proven that he is able to heal. Therefore, those who come to him must believe that he exists because he has demonstrated it. This is what I'm trying to point at. It is not in any way to deny the existence of having faith without evidence, but there is enough evidence that we can use to help our faith in our God. Please, this is the angle I'm coming from, my dear ones.